Uh, hello, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are uh, watching or tuning in in the world uh, at the moment. Uh, my name is uh, John Abdu. Uh, I'm the High Performance Director at United States Water Polo, at USA Water Polo, and I'm honored to be here uh, with you today. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank uh, FINA for providing a great week of learning uh, and all the speakers who spoke this week uh, in the FINA Water Pole Development Program. Um, all the speakers have been uh, very educational and edifying, and I'm honored to be uh, speaking here at the end, and also um, grateful to FINA for uh, the ability to serve on the FINA Development Subcommittee. Uh, honored to do so with my colleagues there uh, and to be able to share with you today and appreciate the work of the um, FINA and the committees and also the FINA TWPC, which continues to try to push our game forward. Uh, so thank you uh, for allowing this time and uh, I'll do my best in the 40 minutes or so allotted to uh, review some things that we do here in the United States and also be able to answer questions. If you have questions uh, during the presentation, uh, please use the chat feature uh, and the Q&A feature on the learning platform uh, and I'll be able to have some time to answer some questions afterwards uh, at the end. Uh, I would also be remiss to say uh, I hope that all of, we, all of you and everyone who's watching or listening at the moment uh, is safe and healthy and well uh, with your families. I uh, wish everybody uh, nothing but health and happiness during these uh, very uncertain times uh, that we're all living in and that everybody is managing to the best of their ability and, and my best wishes to, to all of you out there. Also would like to mention that the, uh, uh, also my empathy and my solidarity goes to all the social movements uh, that are happening across the globe at the moment, um, trying to push progressive change as we, um, move into a new world era. Uh, and I say this uh, as it correlates to United States women's water polo, that I believe the women's water polo um, success in America is built upon and is rooted in uh, the social movements for gender equity uh, in the United States. So as um, the pioneers in our sport have fought for uh, gender equity um, in water polo, uh, that is rooted on the uh, pursuit of gender equity in the states. Uh, and as that has happened at the macro level, at the highest levels of our country, um, pursuing equality and equity for women in our country, that uh, the micro success has shown up in our sports and in, in specifically in water polo. Uh, and it's all rooted and all connected. So as you see these movements, this is the result of a movement. And I think because uh, of those people who fought for this, um, uh, they, we are in a position now uh, to talk about the success or the structure of United States Women's Water Polo. Uh, and I'm humbled to be able to speak about it today as, as, as a male, um, but I also um, would like to give credit to all the, the men and women who built this pipeline to where it is today. And I, uh, one of the benefits of being a, an administrator uh, in, uh, in sports is you get to speak of all the great things that other people have done. Uh, so there's a lot of people who uh, have been a part of this, and, and uh, as you move to the first slide, you can see um, some of the things that we've begin we've begun to do to really understand the structure and push and push this forward, right? So um, big shout out to the uh, to those pioneers and the people who really made this happen, and I will make some many references to them along the way, and also um, a reference a uh, some books that you can find the history of women's water polo in America, uh, if you are so inclined to do that. So, so um, um, that being said, uh, for me, I'm gonna go over five uh, areas today. Uh, one of them is our process, right? We have created a process, um, a detailed process that I will go over today uh, in the United States of what and how we build our pipelines. And, and this started um, about 20 years ago and is built, in, in, and is built to where it is now. Uh, within that process, we have a structure of staffing, of teams, of how we go about our business that works. We also have a high performance model that, that I'll explain um, that addresses all the comprehensive needs of what we believe would be a high performance training group. Um, and we also uh, understand that we have to have a purpose 
and a vision of where we're going. Otherwise, none of this works, and, I, and I've talked to you about it. But I would say that the beginning of the vision was that those who fought for to create infrastructure and processes for women to play sports in America, including water polo, uh, and and that vision has allowed us to then create our own micro vision of what is the is the pathway forward here for for our success. Um, and so, while we've had some success now, our goal at United States Water at USA Water Polo is to have sustained success over a period of time. It is not enough for us to say that we are the best women's water polo team in the world at the moment. It's it's something we. Uh, are grateful for and appreciative of, but uh, the idea is to have sustained competitive excellence through the course of uh, several years as we go. So as we dive into it, um, on the next slide, please. Uh, the reason we built this, this process, right? Uh, many people ask me all the time as they read our documents about the Olympic Development Program, ODP, uh, they'll say it's very complicated or it's, it's very uh, nuanced, it's very detailed, uh, it's it's hard to do this for an, an entire country uh, as as you have here in, in, in America. Uh, but what I always come back to is the to tell people that if we didn't have a process, we would have more problems than if we did. And in this process, what we find out is that most everybody wants to be at the end of the process. If I were to go and survey all the young girls playing water polo in America, and I said, one day do you want to be on the women's water polo team that competes in the Olympics? I would have a lot of women that come back to us and say, we would love to be on that team. But not everybody wants to be a part of the process that leads to becoming a member of that team. So while we have this process, we find out who is willing to be part of this so that we know that they can be helpful in the outcome in the end. So just like any uh, high performing uh, system or group, we have a process that helps us learn and find out about people along the way, their strengths, their weaknesses, that leads to the end. Um, and it's very inspiring to see these young women, as you see in this photo, who are willing to commit themselves and their time to eventually try to become someone like the Betsy Armstrong that you see there, gold medalist winning um, uh, Olympic goalie as we have. So uh, this is the reason that we have a process, is so that we know what people will be like in the outcome. So as we get into this process on the next slide, you'll notice that um, what we have is, and I think the strength, but also the challenge, and I'll get to the challenges here in the United States, is our strength is the bottom of the pyramid, right? So when we have a number of people playing water polo in the States, and you'll hear um, the Federation tout on many occasions that we have 50,000 members, and we have probably more than that, we know for a fact we have more than that playing water polo in the United States, maybe closer to 100,000 total men, women, uh, age groups all over, right? Um, so what we have created is a base at the bottom of the pyramid, as you see there, of clubs, athletes, coaches, referees all across the country. So you have this big base. And so when you have a big base like this, you have to find a way to build a pyramid and a pathway that takes you all the way to the top. Um, but the pyramid does not exist without the efforts of those coaches, athletes, and referees uh, in their regions who are working to build clubs and build opportunities for people in their specific area of the country. So while we have these clubs and we have these athletes and people working in those areas, then as they develop their athletes, we created a system called the Olympic Development Program. And what ODP does is it helps identify the athletes, coaches, and referees from those clubs to then participate in our high performance pipeline into this pyramid. So the first place, the entry level for an athlete is the club that they are competing with in their region. It doesn't start with us, it starts with the clubs and now we help identify and then we say these athletes need extra training, right? Or have qualified for another pathway for them to keep going. And I'll show this on the, uh, again later, but what those zone teams are and what you see in those zones in those regions are the areas all across the country that uh, represent the United States of America. I'll show that on the next slide. Then once everybody competes, in their regions, and once everybody competes competes in their zones, what we call zones, um, and some we clump them together, then we have an Olympic Development Program National Championship. And at that national championship, we had just under 700 girls, women playing at the ODP National Championship. And this is where all the country comes in. As you've become the best in your zone, and you've qualified to make your zone team, 
then you come to compete at the national championship against the best from all around the country. And that is what we call our national championship. At that national championship, there are about 700, I said slightly under, 700 girls, women who are competing in this um, championship. At that championship, we then select the next round of athletes to our national team selection camps. At those national team selection camps, it's approximately between 50 and 70 athletes that are chosen to then for continued training, for continued um, uh, development in one of these four categories. And in those four categories are um, the development national team of 14 and under, the cadet national team at 16 and under, youth national team of 18 and under, and on those odd years where it's uh, available, uh, we have a junior team of 20 and under competing uh, at the FINA World uh, Junior Championships. And so from those teams, those teams are then get the opportunity to uh, train uh, with national team pipeline coaches. Uh, we have found in the last four to five years a much more training and development for those athletes to be there. And then our senior national team coach, um, and credit to all the senior national team coaches we've had uh, over the years for United States water polo, uh, have always been heavily involved in our pipeline, uh, meaning the this pyramid is connected from the top to the bottom. And I cannot stress this enough as you are looking at the structure and the processes in your own countries, in your own areas, uh, even on the micro level in your own clubs, that the top of the pyramid is connected all the way to the bottom of the pyramid. And that is something on the women's side in America that I think we've done uh, a good job of, and I'm proud of uh, the coaches that we've had, You know, um, starting with, with, with Guy Baker, now with uh, Adam Krikorian, uh, who have uh, spent an, uh, an, an, an immense amount of time with the pipeline coaches and with the pipeline development. Uh, and in the last 10 years, um, 11 years now of Adam Krikorian being the coach, um, I think one, one of his traits, uh, we speak a lot about results, but I think one of the things he does a, a very good job of is staying uh, very much connected with the young athletes in our pipeline. And so what this does is there's, no, there's not a disconnect between the top of the pair and the bottom. And as these things remain fluid, and those teams, uh, our pipeline teams are, are training junior youth cadet development, uh, and they know uh, uh, that they're connected to the senior team, then we have a group of senior team athletes, uh, which, which is anywhere from 15 to 20 athletes at a time, training as a group under Coach Krikorian, um, and that is where we select our world championship, our Olympic, our Pan American teams as they, as they move over. Okay? Um, I would also like to mention, as you look at this pyramid, that at each level in the Olympic Development Program, we have coach development and coach mentoring. And that's where Coach Kaporian comes in, but also the other Olympians and the other pipeline coaches who then bring and push their knowledge down through the course of the pyramid down to the zone team. So, for example, during this time of COVID-19 and we are having online learning as we are doing today, our pipeline coaches are spending um, the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, on online learning platforms to help develop our athletes and our zone coaches at the same time with tactical and technical information so that they can be prepared for, better prepared for, uh, when the time comes for those athletes to be identified in ODP. They are being taught the same things in their clubs. They're being taught the same things in their zone teams. They're being taught similar processes along the way. And now that does not mean for us to have a rigid structure that does not allow for creativity or freedom or nuance in teaching but it allows for streamlining communication and streamlining education as it comes up along the way. Um, and we can get into granular details um, if we had more time. When I say that we have approximately 400 clubs, 65 universities, 2,000 coaches, 900 referees, I mean that for all of United States water polo. So this, what you see then is a microcosm of what you see there. And so what we have is a year round schedule of water polo in the United States, um, which includes the largest tournament in the world in a junior Olympics. Um, but it is complicated because you are now managing the uh, expectations of the Olympic Development Program if you are so um, uh, inclined to be chosen for it or to qualify for it, but then also your scholastic um, teams, which means could be from the NCAA, uh, high schools, uh, um, any schooling that you have along the way, once we have students now, obviously athletes who are in elementary school, where we call primary school, to then also compete in their club teams at the side. And this is complicated. Um, so as we talk about this pyramid and we look at the, the map on the next slide, 
you will notice that uh, it is challenging to try to do create a system that streamlines across the country. But because we have created this process, because we have created this, this now structure as we get into structure, you will see that this is the only way for us to be able to very well uh, have the ability to uh, disseminate information across a broad country like this. And for my colleagues in Australia, for our colleagues in Russia, for our colleagues in Canada, uh, China, India, when you have a large country and you're trying to develop sport in that country, you have to find ways like these to be able to get this information out and also deal with the uh, number of places, a number of, of uh, groups that are also calling for the attention of the athletes, the very same athletes that you are trying to develop. Um, and so this is the challenge of a large country uh, development versus a small country development. Um, and that is not to say that there are um, not positives of that as well. So we have, well, obviously you're gonna have a very large athlete pool, but the ability to contain and get elite athlete training for the top of that pyramid becomes more challenging in this environment than in a smaller country uh, where you see um, some smaller geographic sized countries. When I say smaller, I mean geographically sized countries and their ability to have success um, a little more quickly and a little more streamlined in that, uh, in those areas. And we see it across sports, not just water polo, where small countries have made massive strides uh, in, in, in sports. I make reference to the uh, Croatian men's soccer team uh, that may had a great run at the last World Cup, uh, FIFA World Cup, uh, and, and that came out of nowhere for a lot of people, but not for us in water polo. It's not surprising when you see a small country be able to create a system of play um, technical and tactical development of athletes that can then streamline in. So numbers do not, on size, do not always equate to success. That's why this process and the structure we decide or describe now is important. So as you look at the United States map here, you'll see that we have divided the country into, into 11 zones. Hawaii is not pictured here, uh, the, the, the island of Hawaii, um, and that is generally what we would consider our 12th zone. Um, and if you take a good look at the map, you'll also notice that these are very large geographic regions. Uh, for example, I will point out the Midwest. So if you look directly at the gray area in the middle of the map, um, over the years, in the last six years or so, we've divided even that region in half and called it the Midwest and also then the Great Lakes zone uh, at the same time. The Great Lakes meaning Michigan, Ohio, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, and that area um, as one side, and then Missouri and Illinois uh, com competing on the other. Uh, so it's it's we've had to create smaller and smaller regional areas for people to compete to create more access for athletes to do that. Another thing that we've done recently before the national championships that I referenced on the last page, and forgive me for going through this quickly, or and and, and I know it's a lot of information, but uh, it's a short amount of time, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions at the end again in the. Uh, in the chat function as we go. Uh, but another program that we've created recently is the uh, a regional championship. So those regions outside of California um, that, we, that we've uh, mentioned here, uh, we give them an opportunity to compete with their zones against other zones nearby. So on the map, if you were to find North Carolina uh, on the map in Greensboro, North Carolina, we were able to hold a regional championship for the Northeast, the Midwest, the Great Lakes, and the Southeast zones together in Greensboro, North Carolina. In the state of Utah, which is in blue uh, on the map there, uh, you will find, uh, you would find the, the city of Salt Lake City, uh, where in that region, we were able to have a regional championship then for the other regions uh, uh, across the uh, country there, the Pacific Northwest, the Southwest uh, of Texas, uh, what we would call the mountain zone uh, in blue, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, and they got the chance to compete together, and that gave them added training to then be ready for the national championship as they go. You have to take a big country like this and chop it up into smaller uh, regions in order to create more playing opportunities for everybody. There's also the structure of leadership in each one of these areas. So it would be um, uh, as really challenging as it is for myself or my immediate staff to manage an entire country, we have a national staff. And then we also have, we have zone head coaches. We have uh, who then hire zone age group coaches in each part of their country 
uh, each each part of their zone to then manage and lead the Olympic development program and work with the clubs in the area to help identify athletes and bring them into their zone teams and bring them into camps and go. So uh, as you look at this map and you see this, this, this country, you understand that there are uh, specific leadership we have everywhere. So we would have one head coach for men, one head coach for women that are managing the zone and managing that area in regards to the Olympic development program. Overall, we have close to 200 coaches that we employ in our pyramid of structure um, uh, from all around the country that feed into this. Um, and it is our belief, as I spoke about the regional competition, now speaking about the uh, infrastructure, that the growth of our sport in our country has been accelerated by creating infrastructure for the sport to grow. Meaning, as universities add programming, uh, varsity programming for water polo, as high schools add varsity programming for water polo, the facilities at those institutions will then be utilized for water polo. And as they become utilized for water polo, we have created more access points and more places for young women to play the sport of water polo so that they can grow. It is our goal that in every pool in America, there is water polo. Well, there are a lot of water, there are a lot of pools in the world. Not every pool in the world has water polo in it. So we want polo in every pool, meaning infrastructure would have to start with what starts with programming, and then programming will then bring uh, the equipment needed to the pool, the goals, the balls, the caps, everything that that place needs to then begin the process of creating an infrastructure for water polo so that the sport can grow. You cannot convince people to play water polo or have a one clinic or one camp or one-time opportunity if there is no long-term place for that athlete to develop. And the long-term place for that athlete to develop in the United States and in many countries, large countries similar to ours, will be at the scholastic level. So it's important as we look at initiatives, um, uh, we have put a bigger focus on the state of Texas. As you look at the map again, the large, largest yellow state that you see in the Southwest zone, one of the largest states in the country, we've put an effort into making sure that on a scholastic level and the leadership level that they offer uh, varsity water polo at their high schools as an official sport. And people have asked why we do that. And that is because the end result of having it integrated into that scholastic level would be the lowest barrier of entry for athletes to be able to participate in the sport as it is integrated into their scholastic experience and academic experience on a daily basis. And so we are um, excited that in the fall of 2021 uh, that there will be a pilot program in the state of Texas to do that. And we are hoping that more states and more places uh, around the country begin to build that infrastructure. Again, that is the key to growth along with creating regional competitions and training in such a large country and dividing it up in this manner. Uh, next slide, please. So it would be very um, uh, obvious for me to state that if you look at the map that was on the previous slide and try to wrap your head around how to create a system of water polo for a country this large, that one size does not fit all. What is happening in California is not the same as what is happening in Texas, as what is happening in Florida, as what is happening in Ohio, as what is happening in Oregon or New York, the state of New York. It is not going to be the same. So one of the challenges that we have to create and, and address and meet uh, directly is creating programming that is flexible and adaptable to all levels, excuse me, all geographic regions and levels of play around the country. We cannot be too rigid in our approach that would not be flexible to allow for those athletes and those areas to train at their pace in the places that they need and, and giving them what is appropriate for their development. So as we have these age groups of 18, 16, and 14, there may be some places where the age groups are combined. There may be some places where the genders are combined to have both men and uh, women in the same place, boys and girls in the same place training. There may be... Uh, uh, some places that need more time of training at the same cost, give them more time. There may be some places where the training doesn't need to be so long so they can go back to uh, their clubs. Either way, regardless, we have to create a unique process that goes um, meets each place need what they need. What that does is it puts a lot of pressure on the national staff to be able to create these uh, and, and make adjustments along the way 
But believe me, just like any process, it'll be worth it. And we'll talk about that towards the end. We have also created something called Academy Training for Elite Athletes. It was We, we recognized several years ago that the challenge of the large country and not being able to get your elite athletes together uh, would be to give our athletes with our 18 and under coaches, our youth coaches, uh, pipeline coaches, more time and more uh, resources to be able to give those specific athletes that will be part of our most likely identified as part of our senior teams in the future, more training, more time, and more time together. And that is outside of the traditional ODP system and calendar that we have. Um, but it give, we have to address the growth side. I've talked about that a lot already on the map before that we have to spend a lot of time growing the sport of water polo in the country. But we also at the same time on a parallel path need to be developing the elite athlete and giving the elite athlete as much as they possibly can to achieve their potential. Um, the other reason that the academy training exists and the ODP exists is it gives us a national approach. It gives us inclusiveness of all regions across the country. Meaning if an athlete were to show talent and be identified as somebody who is um, worthy of academy training, we would give them that opportunity to be a part of the academy training away from uh, maybe a place that they're developing at a faster rate than their teammates. Uh, and that is, is uh, uh, something that we have to provide all across the country. Um, you know, for example, an Ash Ashley Johnson, our um, gold medal winning goalkeeper at the moment is from the state of Florida. Uh, and as uh, she and, and her sister were developing at a faster rate than maybe some of their teammates, they were given the opportunity to be a part of these things on a national scene so that we can make sure that we are uh, providing the opportunity along the way. Uh, something else that we've created about three years ago that has been, I think, successful for us is we've created a second tier. Again, in a large country, if you only focus on the academy athletes, you're not always going to get the retention that you're looking for uh, for those athletes. So we created a second tier of athletes. For example, um, at the ODP National Championship, I mentioned that there will be approximately 50 to 70 athletes there um, selected to go compete for a national team. I failed to mention that when they make a national team, it is approximately 20, 18 to 20 athletes on each national team, junior youth cadet development. So with, if you're part of that 20, that's great. But what happens to athletes 21 to 50 that went to the national team selection camp but didn't make the national team? Are we so arrogant in our selection process that we truly believe that the 19th athlete that we selected will also be uh, that much better than athlete number 21? Uh, and I say to our staff and our coaches all the time, and I repeat to you again today, that there's no way for us to be that confident. There's no way for us to be that certain that athlete 15, even athlete 10, in the long run will develop into Olympian versus athlete number 30 on the list. So you have to create more programs. We've created a, a futures program with our partners so that they get more uh, training domestically and internationally. The picture you see on the uh, on the screen there is a group that we sent of uh, – uh, young men and women to uh, Budapest, Hungary, uh, two years ago uh, to compete and train in this programming. And what we have found, even in a short three years, even in the short three years of the existence of the Futures Program, that athletes who did not originally make the national team are now going to Futures and then coming back the following year in ODP and then making a national team. So it is broadening the bottom of the net. It is broadening the bottom of the pyramid to allow for more athletes to be competitive in this process and give them opportunity to develop. The long-term development, and this is another um, uh, uh, lecture that we can have on another point, is how we develop athletes on a long-term basis. But it is important that they have a long-term uh, goal and a long-term pathway for development and creating more opportunities for, for this quote-unquote second tier of athletes uh, is important. Um, if you are somebody who feels that they can identify an athlete with 100% certainty, uh, at the age of 16 for future success in water polo, um, please email me and we can talk. Uh, because we are, you, when you look at the idea of athlete identification and what we're talking about is an athlete development and athlete identification process at the same time. There are people who get paid millions of dollars to run organizations in the English Premier League, in the uh, United States NFL, in the NBA, to try to predict the long-term success of athletes in those professional leagues and they are consistently wrong. They're consistently wrong. Um, their success rate at identifying athletes, 
despite being professionals at that level and making significant dollars to be able to make those decisions are wrong on a daily basis. So for us, it is important that we have, especially in a big country with these young athletes, a long uh, term plan for all athletes to keep developing and offer second opportunities for those athletes to come. And this comes to my point about calendar, meaning if an athlete was not identified, if that athlete was not part of the system in uh, the Olympic development program while they were in high school or a national team or in their club, but went to their college system, played in the NCAA and were successful and had success and showed growth in that time, we work very closely with those um, college coaches and NCAA coaches to give them the opportunity to then come back and re-engage re into their system. So there has to be a purposeful and significant connection between all levels and all areas. Again, it's not perfect. It's always going to have some confusions and some misunderstandings and relationships that need to be um, built uh, and spent time with. But it is important that that is uh, there and that collaboration is there. And then again, the purposeful connection between our leaders at the top of our senior team coaches all the way through the system and their presence at events and their presence at high school, college, university, NCAAs, um, age group, club, everything is important. Um, pipeline teams, pipeline team trips, everything it is all integrated. It starts with me, but it, it, the leadership of our coaches is uh, crucial in this. Um, and I'm, I'm going to take a very brief moment to give a shout out to our senior team coach that I did before, but also our pipeline coaches who work tirelessly to make this happen on top of also their full-time jo jobs. In, the, in this structure, our coaches do this on top of the other things that they do. So they do this as a labor of love and for the hope to be a part of this process uh, in the future. Um, I've also I mentioned our virtual coaches education already and that we have been developing and educating our coaches along the way, technical, tactical, all through this virtual side. Um, there's a parallel path of coach education that we have created where we have um, a digital water polo coaching manual um, that is available to all uh, members and also uh, videos of our technical skills at each level to be able to provide that education for all coaches. If this day and age with all that we advances that we have made in technology, including in this time of COVID-19, uh, to be able to create videos of everything that needs to be done and specific videos of the best athletes demonstrating those skills is something that I highly recommend and recommend that and anyone can do it in an accessible way and can get out quickly um, to their coaches. And so there's no excuse at this point for coaches not to be um, developing themselves in this time, especially in, during the downtime, but there will still be no excuse in the future as we have provided the resources for them to have everything that uh, they would need to be connected to this larger scheme of development uh, through through ODP. So let's move on to the how we model our success uh, at the top. And so this is our high performance model. And so uh, I mentioned this already, uh, that the clubs, the people who are developing and the systems that are developing the athletes within their regions, within their zones, are the heart of this. They are at the center of this, the club administrators, the club coaches, those who are in the middle of this, who are doing everything they can to develop those athletes in their home areas and then joining the Olympic development program along the way. Where this model is the most important for us is at the top. So the demonstration of this model happens at the senior national team. And since we're talking about the women today, although it's the ex exact same for the men and we do the same on both sides, um, this model is how we structure and build our uh, national uh, team programming so that we have to have the great staffing. Staffing means our coaching. We have to create a strong competition and training calendar. We have to have strength and conditioning, lifting in the gym, weight, weight room. Uh, that's important. That's led by an expert. It is important that while I organize and um, maintain and lead the, the development of this model, that there are hired experts in each level that I am a facilitator. And my job is to sit back as a facilitator, make sure that I hire experts in each one of these areas and allow them to lead that. And that starts with the coach. You hire an expert coach, you hire a leader at the staffing, we build a competition and training calendar together, we hire a strength and conditioning coach uh, who's an expert in their field, we hire sports psychologists to help us uh, uh, be um, uh, the best that we can be in our mental skills, we have nutritionists who help guide what we are eating along the way. We outsource taking good statistics 
and using our video uh, footage and video editing of things that we need. We have engaged and, and, uh, and, and hired some of the best sports medicine managers uh, in the country and the world to allow us to be able to um, take care of our athletes in a holistic, healthy way throughout the year. And those coaches are in charge of the technical, tactical uh, uh, area for their teams. And then my job is to take their technical and tactical vision and take it into the ODP pipeline as we spoke before. So this model, as I say, higher, and we have these experts in each area and we move um, into each one of these uh, parts of the, of the high performance model, it can be done with resources at the highest level and with some support of the Olympic Committee and things like that. But I want to make the point that anyone who's watching out there who is a club coach, who is a high school coach in America, if you are a club coach in, in Europe, South America, Africa, Asia, wherever you are, you can implement a model like this at almost a cost-free manner. Meaning that the expert opinion, the expert content for each one of these regions is now available online. It's available in this worldwide community of coaches and experts who are sharing knowledge and who are doing this type of education. It's out there. It's out there. And so at a very low cost, at a very low fee, you can implement this program in if not free at a very minimal cost. And then of course, as levels move up, if you're trying to train an Olympic team, then more resources will be put in. But on every level where you are, wherever you are in the world, you can find information like this uh, and videos, resources, text that can be used to build this. I will also say that at the end of any competitive season, the way that we evaluate ourselves as a program is based on this model. So for example, after the 2016, in my time at USA Water Polo, after the 2016 Rio Olympics, this was the model that we used to evaluate how we were as a program and where we need to go forward. And we interviewed our athletes and we interviewed our staff and we took the time to understand where are we deficient and where are we strong in these areas for the next quad. And again, that's at the top, but you can do that at every level and use it as your evaluation process as you look at your program. Are you fit enough? Are you strong enough? Are you using video well enough? Are you using sports psychology? Are you, you, how are your coaches doing? Have you created the right calendar for yourself, right? Are your athletes healthy? Are they getting hurt all the time? You know, do you, where do you, investment do you need to make in sports medicine? That's how we evaluate programs. It's also how we structure them. So um, happy to share that, but it's something that this is our way of viewing our ability to compete at a high level in, in, this, in this model. I want to mention as well that in the, a lot of people will ask me and our staff and in the USA Water Polo, why would you call it the Olympic Development Program and have 700 women at the ODP Girls National Championships and uh, say that, call it the Olympic Development Program? Because if you do, then that gives the idea that everybody is going to be an Olympian. This is not the point of the Olympic Development Program. The point of the Olympic Development Program is to create a process, back to the beginning, that allows for people to prove themselves and try to achieve this idea of Olympism. And again, um, we, we are working under the banner of USA Water Polo through FINA, through the IOC, to do our best at the Olympic Games. And when we compete at these Olympic Games, it is that spirit of Olympism that we are trying to achieve. And we believe that because of the spirit of Olympism pushes all of us to be the best that we can be within our abilities, meaning that to achieve your potential at its highest level with joy and on these values of education and development, that we will have more athletes to choose from when the time comes for the selections for our Olympic teams and for our national teams. So the, the purpose, the vision has to be here, meaning that not we do not expect 700 people to become Olympians, but we do expect uh, that everybody strives to do the best that they can and strives within the ideals of Olympism. And that is the foundation of the Olympic Development Program, which is the backbone of everything that we do. So our purpose then in the next slide is as you get a good look at the team, as you get a good look at the team and you get a good look at um, uh, their circle of trust and power that has led to so much success for them, is that as we go through this, it is important that we're doing it together. What I describe structure and in this process 
is uh, something that is complicated, is something that requires an immense amount of communication, uh, requires constant adjusting and moving and, and uh, adapting and flexibility along the way in everything that we do um, to be able to uh, address the needs of this country. So it takes more time, it takes more effort, and it takes more um, commitment for all of us to do this together. But if we wanted to go fast, we wouldn't do it this way. If we want to go far, we do it together. I often give people the analogy that when it's time for me to uh, select national teams or for us to work on this together, myself and a couple of national team coaches can get in a room and we could be done in a few hours. We wouldn't need the entire pyramid and the process that I um, uh, showed you earlier in this in this presentation. We wouldn't need that. We could go very fast and we could select people very quickly. And then we would be just as successful as the million dollar executives in the NFL who are guessing at who they think will be um, uh, successful athletes in their programs. We're just as successful. But we wouldn't be able to achieve on a national scale the growth, the inspiration, and the development of a sport and a group of people nationwide of what we're trying to do. And that is what is most important to us, and that is what's most important for the sport of water polo domestically and internationally for all of us to uh, achieve our potential together. And that, that's what we are looking for. So um, uh, I'm happy to take questions as I, as I wrap up. On the last slide, you'll see here just some things. I mentioned that there was a book that talks about the great story that has built our pipeline um, uh, on the women's side up, and that book is called Sydney's Silver Lining. Um, the author is Kyle Utsumi, a uh, longtime colleague and um, worker within United States Water Polo, within USA Water Polo, who take, took the time to aggregate all the information about our pipeline. Um, the book can be found on Amazon. It's a great read. Uh, it's a great resource for all, all, all countries, uh, all programs everywhere, just to be able to understand the story and also get the anecdotes of the great women um, and some men who helped build this uh, uh, pipeline to what it is. And I think that's... Uh, I can't, I can't recommend it enough, um, especially in this time of the 20 year anniversary of the first uh, women's uh, water polo games in the Olympics in, uh, in Sydney. Um, also would recommend the, uh, or also uh, the pictures that you see, uh, that is our United States Olympic Training Center where every December uh, we have something that we call the holiday camp where o Olympic development program is the nexus point of all athletes, coaches, and referees together uh, where we develop for a week. We take 120 girls on a yearly basis who are in um, uh, approximately 13, 14 years old uh, to train and compete with our national team coaches for a week there with Olympians. We have referees there, we have coaches there, and we all develop together in the same place at the same time. Uh, and it's it's one of our, our signature programs that we do. Uh, and it's important to utilize our Olympic training centers for these things as we move forward. Uh, and uh, we've tried to start young. The last picture there, as you see, um, we've tried to have a lot of fun and bring joy into this process and into this structure with athletes as young as 9, 10, 11 years old at some of them. We try to integrate them into our camps and it's all that we do together. And we all get involved is because the joy in this process, as Olympism teaches us, comes from these young uh, young athletes and their their ability to be inspired along the way uh, through the process. So um, I appreciate your time. Thank you for allowing me to share, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions uh, that are coming up. I'll open up the uh, I'll open up the chat now, and um, uh, the host can tell me when I run out of uh, uh, time. So one one question uh, one question comes. Um, uh, uh, from a great friend and mentor uh, uh, about how do your coaches follow the guidelines, especially in the age group level? So this is a good question. It is much easier or it is, uh, there's a direct ability for us to manage and maintain the pipeline of coaches within the system, within ODP to follow our, guide, our guidelines. So within the 18, 16 and 14 under levels uh, and the zone teams in the Olympic development program, we are allowed to we can monitor what those coaches are doing. In the club level, it becomes a recommendation. So when you have 50,000 people and uh, all these clubs playing water polo around America, we say, this is what we are doing, and we hope that you are doing it the same way to give your athletes the best opportunity to compete in the system along the, um, and become uh, uh, Olympians or national team members in the future. Uh, so that is always going to be the disconnect for us because we do not say to those coaches, 
uh, in those clubs that you must do it this way. Uh, and so um, there is a good amount of participation. There's a, many of them who are following these guidelines, but of course they have the ability and the freedom in America to teach and uh, uh, run their programs as, as they see fit. You know? um, but it does behoove them, it benefits them to be able to teach those uh, same guidelines and those same technical skills that we um, uh, are teaching so that their athletes are prepared you know, for the future. Uh, another question is there are there big differences between female and male water polo in terms of rules and training um have things been put in place to establish equality uh well yes I mean, that's how i started the presentation i think the opportunities for women um are are vast in the states um and more so than uh you know even in other countries and i think that has led to a lot of our success and i equate that um there in terms of how we train and the rules um, it is almost identical across the board between the men and the women. There's not there. We are not creating exceptions, you know, uh, for for anybody in terms of what we do. If you were to look uh, deep into our tactical and technical trainings for our men and women, it's very, very similar um, in the Olympic development program. And then, of course, as they get to the senior teams, um, they're given the, they're given the same uh, resources. It's equal. And they are allowed to um, uh, the coaches are allowed to lead as, as they see fit as experts. Uh, one more question here too, as, as they keep coming in, um, uh, when women's water polo was out of the program for the 2000, uh, Sydney Olympic games, it was a huge event. Would you say that the public is much more receptive to women's water polo now, or is there still a long way to go? Um, yes. And yes, it was an amazing event. And as I mentioned to read the book and to go back and see some of the things that, um, people like Kyle and Sumi have, uh, have documented for us. Um, and, uh, and it was, and it was, the, the group was very receptive. Obviously the world was very receptive at that time. Um, but yes, there's still a long way to go for there to be, um, uh, more eyes and more, more vision and more popularity of the women's game. And I think that comes through many things. It comes with our ability to, to broadcast and, and see these games at a high level. Obviously we were all hoping for the ability to watch, um, all the great women's water polo teams around the world play in Tokyo this summer. We'll have to wait till next summer to be able to see that. Um, but I do believe that there is a more of a platform and more of a um, appetite, as you as you mentioned here, uh, for for that. And it and it is growing. And it is growing. It is growing rapidly. And part of that, um, just to keep the answer short, would be uh, that it is uh, you are now seeing that people who play women who played women's water polo are now having their own children. And they're having their own daughters play the games and those and their daughters are attracting their friends to play the sport. And this is the generational effects of having these strong, successful um, women be involved in our sport. They're the fruits of now their families and their circles starting to grow as as time goes on will create a, a more of a map uh, of uh, uh, young women who are interested in our sport, which then also adds for more people to be able to to have their eyes on the sport as, as, as you ask. Uh, uh, Graziella asks, can the type of a woman in water polo influence the place that she will have a team? What are the different uh, types that can be found in women's water polo and what positions are generally um, can be done? Okay. Uh, and potentially being uh, stereotyped into being a goalkeeper because you're tall. And, and, and understood. Uh, I think one of the best things about uh, water polo and women's water polo is that uh, any, a lot of different types of athletes can be a part of our game. Uh, and I think we've seen that in success. Uh, we see people with um, different heights, different sizes, you know, um, and uh, different different uh, athletic abilities uh, who could all be a part, all be a part of the game. And I think that's uh, one of the beautiful things that we see. And so I think our sport is open to all. I would say what's the most important type that you ask, you know, morph type that you're asking athletes in women's water polo is to be athletic, meaning the definition of being athletic in water polo and women's water polo specifically is the ability to be athletic in the water, which translates to being able to swim well. It means being able to get over your hips well, being able to, to move from the vertical to the horizontal position at, in, in, in a very fluid manner. So the more athletic you can be in the water, the more uh, ability you'll have to play really any position for us. And especially in the future of water polo where we're headed, um, the, the ability to uh, be able to play multiple positions is gonna be important. So work on your athleticism first so that you have. Uh, 
Uh, one more question. Uh, I'd really like to get into water pool competition, but is there an age limit to start and have the chance to be selected uh, in the program? Thank you, Celine. Uh, no. Um, so I think in the Olympic development program, we were focused on the age groups that we um, said, you know, which is 20 and under, 18 and under, 16 and under, 14 and under. Um, and, uh, um, but if somebody were older than 20 years old and they were identified in the program, there's opportunities for them to be involved. And I think under 14, 10, 11, 12 year olds, um, is about when we get started in there, um, uh, of what, of what we can, can have them do, uh, into our system. So, um, I think the age is not a factor. Um, I have a colleague in Australia, uh, that always says if, if you're old enough, you're good enough. Uh, and so it's uh, uh, it, it's uh, not a factor in what we're doing. I would appreciate the ability to, to engage uh, in the water at an athletic way, being able to move well in the water, have a good relationship with the water, how you move in the water, how you uh, relate to the water, uh, and age doesn't matter. Um, that is the, uh, the last question um, that I... Uh, uh, I'm able to take because of time. I know it was a uh, fast presentation. Uh, again, my best wishes to uh, everybody around the world um, during this uh, time of uh, a worldwide pandemic. Uh, and my empathy and solidarity continues to be with the social movements out there. As we have seen uh, advances for uh, women around the world, our sport on the women's side will continue to grow and flourish. And I'm honored and humbled to be a part of that. Thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you again to FINA for the support uh, and the invitation to be a part of this. Um, my best to everyone. Thank you.